Hi everyone, uh, my name's Dan Isaac. Uh, I work at the University of Exeter as a business intelligence officer and a data visualization specialist. Uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself and a little bit about my day job, but I'm mainly gonna be talking about data visualization. Uh, data visualization is um, about making data visual. The visualization bit is about making it visual, making pictures of our data. And that's why I've called this sort of this initial talk drawing pictures and telling stories with data because that's kind of what we're trying to do when we present data in a data visualization. Okay. Um, so just to sort of briefly describe what data visualization is with an example, I've got a simple sentence here. Two teams, a blue team and an orange team play three games. The orange team won a game A by six to five. They won game B by seven to three and they lost game C by eight to nine. Now there's quite a lot of information there and you have to read that sentence several times to really sort of understand what's going on. But if we visualize that data, we can begin to understand a lot more simply and easily what's happening. The simplest way to visualize data is like this, using a table. So here we can see in the table, the blue team, the orange team, the three games they played and the scores. And just having them laid out in a table makes it much more easy to see and interpret. But we can also take those numbers and really turn them into pictures into a, a graph or a chart like this. Um, here we've simply used points where we can see the blue team and the orange team scores in each of those three games. We can join those points together to make a line chart. And that gives a slightly different emphasis of the data. We get the line gives us the sort of movement over, over time, over the course of those three games. Another thing we could do is present those numbers using a bar chart like this. So those three charts are actually showing you the exact same data as we've got in the table and as we've got in the sentence. But by drawing those pictures, by visualizing it in different ways, we get a slightly different and a much clearer sense of, of what those numbers actually mean. Now, using points, using lines and using bars are the most simple way of presenting data. They're the sort of building blocks of most data visualizations you'll see. There are a lot more complicated examples of data visualizations that we do get though. Um, here's one a data visualization I wanted to share just that I thought was really um, interesting and it's doing something slightly more complicated. This is a visualization showing how popular your birthday is. It's based on American data, um, but this is something called a heat map. So it's using color to represent how popular uh, each day of the year is as a birthday. So if you look down the left hand side, you can see the months of the year. If you look along the top, you can see the days of the month. So if you have a look at this, you can probably find your birthday. Um, and if it's a lighter color, it's not a very popular birthday. If it's a darker purple color, then it is a popular birthday. So I can see my birthday is actually on September 17th. And I can see that's a really popular time um, to have a birthday. When you actually look at this, you see some really interesting other things as well. There's lots of um, birthdays on Valentine's Day, for example, and there's hardly any birthdays on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. It seems like women are able to hold their babies in at Christmas. Um, well, clearly there's something more going on than that, but this is the kind of thing I find really interesting when data is visualized well. You really begin to see these interesting features of the data. Um, another sort of point where data visualizations are everywhere without you really realizing are computer games. Uh, many of you probably recognize this as a screenshot from Minecraft. Um, and if you look at the bottom, there are several data visualizations there. We have the heart symbols, which are representing how much health our character uh, has. So in this case, our character has seven and a half hearts out of 10, showing that they've got that much health left. Um, there's other signs there showing how hungry the character is, how much experience they've got, how much energy there is left in each of their tools and weapons, and how many um, different materials they've got for building. All of these things are data visualizations. They're data being presented in a really clear, easy way to help you navigate around in the world of Minecraft. So that sort of gives you an idea of what data visualization is. It's about taking your numbers and kind of turning them into pictures in a, in a simple sense. But if we really want to communicate effectively and, and explain to people what our numbers mean, one of the best ways to do that is through telling a story. Stories are, are really powerful. People remember stories. And so it's a really great way to, to communicate is through telling stories. So I wanted to share three stories um, here, three stories about climate change. And these are ultimately based on the same data, 
but they're telling three very kind of different stories. This first visualization is known as the warming stripes created by a guy called Ed Hawkins. Um, and this is showing over time from left to right over the last 150 years, how much warmer the world has got using the global average temperature is represented using color. So light blues um, are lower temperatures and darker reds are higher temperatures. And you can clearly see as we move through time, the world has got much hotter. So this is a very sort of simple image, but it's telling a really clear story about climate change, about global warming and how the world's getting warmer. Here's another story, seven things um, to know about climate change. And this is uh, from the National Geographic website. Um, and this is a more traditional kind of story told through journalism, telling you seven things about global warming. First thing you want to know is that the world is getting warmer. So the same data we saw from the warming stripes presented here in a slightly different way and presented on a website with lots more information below so you can find out more information about each part of the story. There's a second part of the story. Uh, global warming is because of us. Um, and this is a visualization where these black dots are representing how much carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere. Now, unfortunately, I've not got time to show you this whole story, but you can sort of see how we're going through sort of slide by slide here, um, different information that they want to present to tell us a story um, about climate change. And if you're interested in this, I'd recommend, yeah, go and take a look, seven things to know about climate change on the National Geographic website. But here's one other story, again, using the exact same data, but saying something completely different. This is, again, showing from left to right how um, global temperature, average temperature have changed over the last 150 years. Now, if you look at this, you think, well, it doesn't look like global temperatures have changed much over 150 years. But clearly, that's, that's wrong. That's misleading. And if you look at the y-axis, which is the one on the left-hand side, you'll see that the scale being used is one from 0 Fahrenheit up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's just completely inappropriate for this data. You look at this, and we know that global temperatures have gone up um, sort of one or two degrees Celsius. Um, but because they've chosen that ridiculous scale, um, it gives us a very misleading impression of that data. So this gives a really sort of good example of how by the sort of design decisions we make when we present our data, we can end up creating very, very different stories. So we do need to be careful. I just wanted to very quickly mention my day job, because um, while as I am um, a data visualization specialist, I give training on data visualization. Um, my day job is as a business intelligence officer at the University of Exeter. And in that job, I basically need to find out what information uh, my colleagues need, what information other people at the university want about the students who study at the university, the, the finances of the university, the research we do. I need to go out and find that data and then present it back to them present it back to them using data visualizations. Um, and this is um, an example of one report I had to build, um, something called the People Report, which talks about who works at the university, um, who they are, whether they're male or female, how much they get paid, that sort of thing. And you'll see here, before I've created a data visualization in an IT tool, I've actually created it on a pencil and paper. Um, and I would recommend that to all of you. Um, before you start doing sort of clever things in a computer, it's great just to lay out your ideas on a piece of paper, lay out a grid, and get an idea of, you know, I want a bar chart here, a line chart here, what sort of features do I want in different places? And so that's something I did, literally drawing pictures in my day job to create a report which ultimately ended up looking like this in the system that we use um, to present our data. So I just thought I'd use that as an example of how I apply data visualization in, in the real world in, in my day job. One thing I'm really interested in personally, though, is psychology. I'm currently doing a master's degree in psychology on top of my um, day job. And for me, as much as we can do really clever things to present data in a data visualization, the most important thing is knowing your audience. It's knowing how people work. If you present some really clever picture to someone, it's not being very effective if they don't understand what they're looking at or how to, to sort of interact with it. So we need to understand the people side. So that's why I think psychology is also very key to, to, to data presentation. Um, and all this um, pyramid is showing is how important that when we're thinking about data visualization, we're not just thinking about data. We're taking our data, we're turning it into information, information to present to people. We want that information to give them knowledge 
and we ultimately want them to have the knowledge to, to become wise, to have the wisdom to, to make wise, effective decisions based on the data, the information that we've presented to them. So when we're creating data visualization, we're aiming for wisdom. We're aiming to create knowledge and wisdom within our audience. And a key aspect of psychology is actually perception. Perception is how we see the world around us. Um, and I just got this as an example of kind of um, one feature of perception. I've got a question for you, looking at this image. Which tile do you think would be darker? Tile A or tile B? Now, I'm thinking most of you probably look at this and you see A as a dark tile and B as a lighter tile. But actually, those two tiles are actually exactly the same color. Now, you might not believe me, but I promise you I'm telling the truth. Um, in this image here, we've got the checkerboard effect. So effectively, it looks like A is a black tile and B is a white tile. Um, we've got the fact that A is written in white and the B is written in a darker color. We've got this cylinder with a shadow cast across the checkerboard. All of these things make us think that A is dark tile and B is a light tile. But in reality, they're exactly the same color. So this sort of makes this point that we don't always see the world as it actually is. Um, and that's an optical illusion, and I love optical illusions. Um, and here's another one, which I've actually got some props for here. Um, if you look at these two pieces of train track, it looks like one of them is, or the one at the bottom, is actually longer than the one at the top. So it's something known as, known as Jastrow's illusion. But anyone who's played with this wooden train track will know, no, they're exactly the same size. But you can see how the mind kind of can see things or interpret things that aren't actually there. So it's important that we're kind of aware of these things. I've got another question for you all here. Um, I'd like you to have a look at this slide and count the number of fives that you can find on this slide. How many number fives can you find here? I'll give you a moment to look through that. I'll just say to those who, who are watching, if you want to put it in the chat section, your answer, and then I can um, tell Dan, or Dan can have a look as well, if you want Dan, if you can see any coming through. Cool. I'm afraid I can't see the chat, but yeah, please. Don't worry, I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look. So I'd say usually um, I get answers within sort of 15 to 30 seconds here. Danny, Danny said six. George, George has said five. Okay. Well, I'll see the correct answer in a moment, but I want you to look at the next slide um, and do the exact same thing. Now, these two slides are exactly the same. Um, so you'll see, well done, the correct answer was six to the person who said six. Um, and this is making a point that I took uh, a task that was initially quite hard. You had to spend a long time very slowly looking through, um, looking at those number fives. As we can see, sometimes people were inaccurate. They might have missed one and counted five instead of six. And it took a long time. While as this task was easy, you can see those number five sort of popping out of the screen. They're right there. Um, and you can count that there are six of them immediately. Um, so what this is highlighting is how we can make simple changes to take some, a task that was really complicated. Um, and by understanding a bit about how human perception works and highlighting the things that we want people to see, we can make that task so much easier, so much, um, so much quicker. Um, and that's one thing that we can make use of when we present data visualizations. So if I go back to this first slide, I'm using color. I'm using color to clearly tell you when we're talking about the blue team, when we're talking about the orange team. And for example, in the bar chart, I'm using length. We can immediately see the differences in the length of those bars and make judgments about when the orange team did better and when the blue team did better. Um, so knowing a bit about how people see things, we can draw people's attentions to the things that we want them to see. And that's one of the key parts um, of, of data visualization. And the last couple of things I wanted to share with you, I just wanted to leave you with a couple of tips um, for creating data visualizations yourself. The first tip was this, I want you to keep things simple. Um, and this is all true in many things of life, but in data visualization, it's very true. I created this data visualization using Excel to show five years of student number growth at the, student, at the University of Exeter, how many student numbers there are. And student numbers did go up quite a lot during this time. So I've added a smiley face to say, yep, yeah, we're happy that student numbers are growing up. They're growing up, so I've added an arrow. I've put some wording in the middle um, to try and emphasize this fact. And I've also added lots of colors and borders and lots of sort of other stuff to try and make this exciting and engaging. 
does it help us to understand how much student numbers have gone up? It doesn't. If I take all of that away and go with something that looks simple like this, here we've pretty much just got data. We've just got the line showing the student numbers going up and a bit of information to tell us, yeah, we're talk these are the years, these are the numbers, um, and we're talking about student numbers at the University of Exeter. This is so much simpler and it's so much clearer. You look at this, you instantly see the gradient of that line, and you can see numbers are going up. Um, and it's so much clearer. So I would encourage people to always keep things simple. It's always the best way to, to present data. And one last uh, tip I wanted to share with you was why we should say no to pie charts. Some people love pie charts. Um, and you probably get taught about pie charts at school, but they're not the best way for communicating information. They're not the best way for telling stories with data. Here's just one example of a particularly bad pie chart. Um, created to show the most popular emojis. So yeah, you can kind of see that crying face, and, you know, crying with laughter emoji is the most popular, love heart is also popular. But then we've got kind of a million segments of pie, which we don't even know what they mean. And it creates lots of lovely color, but it doesn't really tell us very much at all. Um, and this is kind of the problem with pies is we're asking people to judge different area, to compare different area of segments of pie. So I've got another quick question for you um, to make a point here. How much bigger do you think the circle on the right is compared to the circle on the left? So the area of the circle on the right, how many times bigger do you think it is than the one on the left? So once again, if you have an answer for that, just put it in the chat. We'll see if those will come through now, Dan. Okay. So Danny's saying 10, 10 times bigger. Yeah. George, George has said six this time, six times bigger. Okay. Okay, I'll tell you the correct answer is 18. So that circle is 18 times bigger than the one on the left. Now I know when I've done this with big groups of people, I get answers as low as five and as high as 50. And the point is that people are really bad at doing this. Um, people are really bad at making those comparisons between how much bigger one area is than another area. Um, we're really good at making judgments in differences in length, but we're really bad when it comes to area. And so this is the problem with pie charts. Pie charts are very common. We see pie charts all over the place. But when we give someone a pie chart, we're asking them to compare the different size of the segments of the pie. So if I was to show you this and ask you, well, which segment's bigger, the orange one, the yellow one, the green one, you could probably tell and you'd probably be right, but it's quite a lot of kind of mental effort again for you to do that and kind of risk that you might make the wrong judgment based on what you're seeing. So does it help to make a pie chart 3D? No, it doesn't. It makes it much worse. Making something 3D actually really distorts what we're looking at. In this case, you can see how the things at the front of the pie actually look much bigger than the things at the back of the pie. And we've got this sort of surface along the bottom of the pie, which it actually isn't data at all. It's just completely misleading. Making things uh, 3D is always kind of misleading and it's really hard to interpret what we're looking at. So yes, don't make it 3D. Maybe we need to explode the pie to make it more exciting. No, no, we don't want to do things like this. Again, we might try and think, well, let's make it more exciting, but ultimately we're just obscuring the data. We're making it harder to actually read the data um, in, that we're presenting. Presenting data in a bar chart is always, in my opinion, much clearer. If you can see the, the data in this bar chart on the right, it's exactly the same as the data in the pie chart on the left. But when we're comparing the length of bars, we can do that so much more easily than we can comparing the segments of the pie. So in my opinion, yeah, this is the only good pie chart. Pie I have eaten and pie I have not yet eaten. Um, and that's all from me for now. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. And I've got a website, graphicinsight.org, if people are interested in finding out more about about me uh, but yeah thank you I look forward to hearing your questions thank you so much dan um for sharing that powerpoint and presentation with us today um so many kind of interesting themes and topics that can come from data visualization as you've just shown um so for those that are watching now if you've got any questions for dan can you please put them into the q a facility or you can put them in the chat section if you want as well um, so george's already asked one here and, and it's kind of one i was going to ask as well so he's asking what was your favorite subject at school growing up um dan okay uh, it was uh, maths probably um i think from a young age always always enjoyed maths 
um, and I guess as I got older I was yeah, more interested in sciences. Um, I actually studied philosophy uh, when I was at university which was a bit different um, but I think kind of it's interesting because I'm I'm not that old but kind of I'm old enough that when I was at school you know we didn't teach IT in the same way that we do now I was kind of taught how to use a word processor and um, and how to use a spreadsheet but I wasn't taught kind of really how how to work with data so I didn't actually have the opportunities to kind of do the stuff I'm doing now but but clearly maths and knowing a bit about science and stuff kind of lays lays the the bedrock for for what I'm doing now so is that is that what made you want to go into the field of into the data industry um if I'm completely honest I personally kind of went into it by accident I think I kind of didn't I've always been a person who never really knew exactly what I wanted to do um but I ended up um using on a graduate placement actually at the University of Exeter working with data and I just realized it was something I, I really enjoyed I really enjoyed that challenge of yeah taking these sort of huge huge tables full of lots and lots of numbers and trying to turn them into into pictures to, to help tell the story of what was going on and that's a challenge I've always I've enjoyed and I've I've run with that ever since and George just asked, added to that as well did did you kind of study psychology when you were at school as well or kind of through college or anything like that like that I didn't actually I've kind of more recently growing up became interested in psychology I did philosophy at university which is sort of related um but different um the actual kind of understanding of psychology and how the human mind works how human behavior works is something I've just become personally interested in over the last five to ten years and and for me, the personal thing I like to talk about is the psychology of the data visualization. I think there's lots of people out there who can tell you about how to use different tools and how to use different software. Um, and, you know, whether you're using Excel or you're using something more sophisticated or coding in Python or using Tableau or something like that, um, you still need to understand the, the psychology of kind of what works well and what people can understand and what people don't. So that's what I'm really interested in. So within the project that we're running, the Stat Wars project, um, young data scientists have to use Excel and other programs like that. Is this something important and something that you, you use all the time uh, in your job, Dan? Absolutely. Yeah, I use Excel every single day. And I think even people who are using all kinds of fancy, sophisticated tools out there um, are still using Excel every day because it is the, it's a tool that everyone um everyone uses to do the basic things with numbers, the basic um, manipulations they need. And even people who aren't in the, the data industry, um, more and more you need to know how to use Excel um, in order to, to do the sort of basic maths, um, uh, dealing with your data, whatever that may be, and, and to do basic data visualization as well. And even when you're um, using Excel to create bar charts, line charts, whatever they may be, um, usually you can sort of use the wizard or whatever it might be in Excel, just sort of run through and create something. Um, but knowing about data visualization, you can go into the sort of settings and use some better colors and um, decide that you want to make your bars a slightly different size and all these sort of things just to just to make your visualization a bit better. And you can do that in Excel as much as you can in any other tool. I think you showed a few examples in your presentation as well, Dan, but do you create um, infographics as well uh, with your data visualization? Um, I do. I mean, yeah, infographics is a sort of, yeah, one of those terms, I think, that means different things to different people. But um, I do, I, what I would say I do is create dashboards because my audience is more um, kind of managers at the university who just want information about kind of what the university looks like. But occasionally you might just have a one-off task where you want to just tell a very, a, a very particular story um, using an infographic, like you said, just to, just to sort of run through, like with a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, using that data to and some really nice images and, and visualizations to, um, to to give that story and to communicate well and then yeah an infographic can work I know you mentioned about um, climate change as well Dan is this something that's important to you as well yeah absolutely I mean climate change it should be um, yeah important to to everyone um, and I think with data visualization I included some examples there about sort of climate change and um, data visualization relating to climate change. And it is a huge area that data visualization can help with, because I think um, a good data visualization really helps to, to promote the truth, to promote you know, what's going on out there. And hopefully I've sort of shown with one or two of my examples, um, by presenting the data of global warming um, clearly and effectively, it, it becomes very clear how, you know, um, what a significant issue we've got. So yeah, it's very important. Um, very important to me and yeah should be to everyone 
I, I know you um, created a video for us as well um, where you, you were suggesting three changes that you would make. Um, it might be putting you on the spot a little bit here, Dan, uh, but is there any kind of changes that you would make in your life um, or anything that could give the young participants listening today any ideas on what they could change uh, in their project? So for climate change, yes, that is putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> um, and other, and other things around, say, um, I think the last interview we had with Rebecca Eid, she was saying something about fashion that she um, would buy from different places or try and keep clothes as long as she could because they, they have a big impact on, the, on, on climate change. Yeah, so yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, that's a very good point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah re pre loved clothes and yeah, use, reusing things. I mean, I think the general idea of, of reuse and being less less wasteful only only you know using mm -hmm. the things that we need um certainly a yeah a big fan of recycling uh using public transport um all those little small changes that we can make to just sort of create a culture um when we're we're yeah we're being less less wasteful um i guess and and do you think the data industry is 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 it something that everyone can go into is it something for everyone i know you said it's a very kind of varied role mm. I think it is. I think there are lots of different aspects to it, and I think it's evolving um, very quickly. Um, to be honest, I think you know some of the younger people listening now, the kind of jobs that you'll be doing don't exist at the moment. Um, you know, the, the way things are evolving, it's really hard to predict. And the, certainly, the job I did now did do now did not exist when you know when I was younger. And so it's quite hard to to predict. But you know, the the IT skills, the data manipulation skills of of a lot of kids now are you know are better than the adults. And I think that's gonna um, that's going to continue. Yeah, I agree as well. There's going to be a lot of jobs in the future that, um, yeah, that we don't have a clue about yet or anything yeah. to do with it at all. Um, we just, uh, just for those who are watching, if there's any more questions you want to type into the Q and A section or in the chat section as well, just put them in there, uh, for us. Um, is there any kind of tips or advice you would give to those uh, that are listening today? Uh, Dan? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess just sort of, I always think just generally, um, just sort of find the thing you enjoy, uh, find the thing you've got a passion for um, and, and go for it. And certainly when it comes to something like this challenge, I mean, as I said, I think it's important everyone should feel passionately about climate change and just sort of find, find the angle that you find most interesting um, and run with it because you're always going to kind of do better work if it's something that you, you're passionate about and you can always find sort of some way of making it interesting. I kind of that's what I've kind of done with personally with my data visualization. I've I've had sort of various roles at work. I'm actually a qualified accountant as well and used to be involved in finance, but it's always been the kind of the data angle and the data visualization in particular that I've been interested in. So through sort of following that and following my passion, I've kind of created a little niche for myself. And so I guess as a tip, I would say, yeah, try and find that thing you're interested in and really and really run with it. And I think, like you said, that you, you've had lots of variety in your role um, and doing lots of different things as well. So I think that's really important, like you said there, uh, Dan, uh, some really good advice as well. I know you said you didn't like um, using pie charts uh, a, a lot or you, do, you don't like using them at all, do you? Um, so is there any kind of charts that you use all the time or that you use maybe more than others that you, that you enjoy using? Yeah, I think this is in the sort of the world of data visualization that I'm in, the kind of pie chart battle is a big one um, in the sense that yeah it, because of the reason I've discussed they're not very good at communicating and I do tend to stick with bar charts and line charts for the vast majority of what I do line charts are good if you want to show change over time and bar charts are good if you want to just make a comparison between you know two different categories um, and as I said you can do really interesting things with the colors with the size of them with um, you know, how they're presented on the page, with how you lose the legend, all these different things you can do to make them kind of more clearer and more and more engaging. Um, but I would, yeah, very much keep it simple. Just keep those kind of simple elements and do something interesting uh, with them. And they're certainly the ones that I use, you know, 95% of the time. And there's then occasionally the odd case where you've got a very particular story that you want to tell where you can use something slightly more interesting. Um, I think like that heat map example I showed at the beginning with, with birthdays, I've used that kind of example quite a lot um, just because it works really well to give you a quick view and allow you to sort of find the thing that you want to see and use the color contrast to, to explore the data. So that's another thing that I think can work really well. 
And just the last question I'd like to end on, Dan, um, obviously, obviously, obviously throughout your kind of role uh, and your career, has there been any kind of shocking statistics or any kind of facts that you've um, found entertaining at all or interesting? Um, that is putting me on the spot again. There are lots. Um, <laughs> I'm struggling to think of one that comes to mind. I think that's the thing without that. There is so much data out there now. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is another thing with you know the growth of the internet and all this sort of stuff. There's so much information there that there's there's a million and one things um, that would that would surprise us. Um, but yeah, I'm struggling to think of one. Yeah, it's all right. I know. I, I, I know. I, uh, sorry about that. I know. There's. I know. There's kind of lots, obviously, around say just climate change in general as well. Um, a yeah. lot of statistics around that. But like you say, there's so much data out there. Um, it's, 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 I think it's quite, um, crazy as well. Yeah. Have, have you been, have you been working from home then at the moment during the COVID, uh, crisis? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Actually my, I worked from home one day a week before all of this and the team I work in were already <laughs> quite well set up for working, uh, remotely. Um, so yeah, it's all been, it hasn't changed my day to day a huge amount in the sense that we, we talk with each other, um, through, through Microsoft teams and zoom and things like that. Um, and we can share our data, obviously, and the tools we work in. We can collaborate all online. So yeah, I've been home here, but it's been very much um, sort of business as usual. Just kind mm -hmm. of miss miss the people I work with, and you know, miss the miss the setting and all that sort of stuff. Well, I'd just like to say a big thank you, Dan, uh, to you for, for joining us today and, and, and taking time out of your day uh, to do this for us. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed answering those questions. I have. No, thank you very much. Fantastic. And thank you for those who've been uh, sending in your questions and answering the questions throughout um, Dan's presentation. Um, I hope you've all been inspired to take on our Stat Wars competition and use our resources at statwarscompetition.com. And uh, please join us uh, for any upcoming interviews we have as well in the new academic year. So uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. So bye, everyone. Uh, bye, Dan. Brilliant. Bye. Thanks. Bye.